Chad Night Africa Live, about to begin. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to get down. I'm coming. I'm coming. coming Chad Night Africa Live, Afrocentric solutions to Africa's challenges. We're going to dance. We're going to get down. Showcasing Africa's touristic luxurious. We're going to party. Party, party. The other story of Africa. And when we jam, it's out of sight. This song right here. Chat Night Africa Live, about to begin. I'm ready. I'm coming. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to get down. We're gonna get down. We're gonna get down. We're gonna dance. We're gonna dance, we're gonna dance. Chat night I'm Africa coming. Night, about to begin. Coming to get down. We're gonna dance, we're gonna dance. I'm ready, I'm coming. I'm dancing, I'm dancing. We're gonna dance, we're gonna dance. And now, Chat Night dance. Africa Live with Divine Chamuco. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Voices of Africa Chat Night Africa. How could we be responsible for the bad governance we complain about? This is going to be challenging, and we should challenge ourselves. You see, until we look at ourselves in the mirror, we will keep thinking that the problem is someone else. And that's how Africa remains in the record books of bad governance. To discuss this thorny subject, we bring you Dr. Richard Munang. Dr. Munang is an African who thinks very, very differently. Dr. Munang will be joining us from the Nairobi capital of Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, you see on the screen, Dr. Richard Munang, a few words, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Nidhi Wine, for having me again. And it's a really a great pleasure to be uh, live on chat night. Uh, the, the, the reality of the challenges we face across the world and also within Africa is uh, such that we cannot be able to solve the, those challenges we face using the same approaches that cost them. And one of the most talked about issues in the continent uh, is good governance. And good governance is equated to be the responsibility of government alone. But more importantly, that misses the point because you cannot be able to just think that using that linear approach to discuss good governance, it is very, very crucial to start diagnosing some hidden aspects, what I call latent aspects that have been ignored for quite a very long time, expecting that as a result of change of governments or change of institutions, reality was just done uh, uh, as, as we wished. But the reality will not be done unless we looked into critical aspects, which is what we're going to discuss today. Dr. Richard Munan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you earlier in the week, we have a co-host. He is professor of journalism and political science in Atlanta, Georgia. Join me now in welcoming, going forward, the co-host at this Pan-African platform, Professor Ben Bongan. Thank you, Divine, and uh, welcome to Dr. Monang. Uh, thank you, all of you who are joining us uh, today, because the topic Dr. Monang is going to, to tackle it concerns all of us. 
That is uh, Professor Ben Bongan. Now he's a colleague at Chat Night Africa Live. I will call him Ben, and he understands why. Ladies Perfect. and gentlemen, today we have a special guest, and he is a keyboard maestro in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming Eric Waller on the platform. Eric Waller. Thank you, Mr. Divine Chamiko. And thank you to everyone watching. You welcome here. Thank you. As you can see, it's going to be a special broadcast this week. How could you be responsible for the bad governance we Africans all complain about? Our phone lines will be open so that you can disagree or agree with our guest, Dr. Muna. One thing I guarantee you, by the time 90 minutes of this broadcast ends, you will be sitting on your seat's edge. Now we will begin on a very high musical note. This is Eric, Eric, Eric Walla. Right, thank you. Can you hear the sound? Yes, Eric, we can hear you can start. This is Chat Night Africa with a special performance live by Eric Walla from Maryland. Eric, you have the platform. You are 
Awesome God, you are high and lifted up, mighty God. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Eric Waller. Um, tell us in one minute who you are, what you do. Eric yes, Waller is my name. Yes. Eric Waller is my name. I'm a Cameroonian from a village of Bali, Younger. Married to my beautiful wife with four kids, a musician, a full time musician. I do teach music, I do record music here at my studio. I do uh, performances for your wake up, birthdays, and stuff. Beautiful. Yeah. We will have two reggae songs back to back, and then we'll bring on our guest and the co host, Ben Bongang. Ben Bongang is the co host at Chat Night Africa, the Plan Af Pan African platform. And of course, we'll have Dr. Richard Munang. Over to you one more time, Eric Walla. Yeah. 
My goodness, uh, thank you so much, uh, Eriwala. You have a last word. We needed this thermostat of yours in the house because the discussion is going to be combustible, I can assure everyone. We are talking about the bad governance across Africa and whether we, in a way, do not play a part. And, and I'm sure that many people are going to be very su su surprised when they hear this. Well, wait until the co-host, who is a professor of journalism and political science, and uh, our guest today on the show, Dr. Richard Munang, when they come on the platform, you will get to understand what I mean by a show that's nothing short of a firecracker. Eric Walla, you have your last word, please. Well, uh, to me personally, before I go, the well-being of Africa doesn't depend on the presidents alone. We all have to play a part. And that's why, musically, if it praises God, if it worships God, I'm going to play it. If it's going to make somebody question what they are doing and try to do better and be a plus and a blessing to this world, then I'm going to play the music. If the music is going to destroy somebody and make them, you know, uh, do some dirty stuff and go backward, I'm not going to play it. So we got to look in the mirror and ask what is our contribution? Because the problem might be us also. Thank you. You said it as if you you spent the night with uh, Dr. Richard Monang in the same home and had a discussion on the topic, which we're going to uh, be uh, talking on in just a moment. Thank you, uh, Brother Erica Walla. You're welcome, Mr. Divine. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming our guests. I'm going to ask him a first question. And Professor Ben Bongang, 
the co-host of Chat Night Africa, the Pan African platform, will take it from there. Join me now, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Dr. Richard Munan, connecting live from one of the most beautiful cities in Africa, Nairobi, Kenya. Dr. Richard Munan. Beautiful. Dr. Richard Munang, thank you for coming back on the platform. Thank you for having me, Nee. That's the reason why we keep bringing you back. You see, when you dip your finger in a jar of honey, <laughs> you don't do it once. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> By the time the show ends, it'll feel like you were saying, well, if you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. But it's much more than that. Dr. Richard Munang, my question, the, the opening question to you, sir, is when you talk to Africans about go bad governance or you eavesdrop on their conversations, fingers are pointed to those in power mm -hmm. as being responsible for Africa's wars. Dr. Munang, why are you right in saying that's really not the case and why they're wrong when they say that's the start, the root of the problem. Thank you, uh, Nid Divine, for that question and thanks again for bringing me back uh, to the show. The, the reality is this, uh, this African proverb put it in perspective, that a flea might trouble a lion more than a lion can trouble a flea. What this tells us is that we ignore certain things which at the end of the day becomes actually the most consequential things that we could have actually been focusing on. When you look at the entire African continent today, we have been conditioned, and I use the word condition intentionally and I'll explain this as we move ahead. We've been conditioned to think that everything about governance is the responsibility of government. That is a false narrative. And that false narrative has perpetuated over decades and even over centuries. What is the point? The point is simple. A wrong thesis has been formulated around good governance, rather than looking at what governance actually means. Governance is pretty much just about decisions and actions that work for or against people. And governance is actually carried out by people themselves. It's not, and these people come from the very society in which we live in. That then means that the key aspect of governance is people. And if the people attitudes are flawed, then the decisions or the actions they take will also be flawed. And that's the thesis in which we need to premise this. And when you look at that, then you ask the question then, should we be talking about governance around institutions alone or ar around five years or seven years election cycles alone? No. We shouldn't look at it from that perspective. We therefore need to look at governance from two perspectives, which is more realistic. And I'm not talking about academic exercise. It's not an academic exercise, it's a reality. Governance have two aspects, which is the soft aspect and the hard aspect. And the soft aspect is our minds. In this case, the people's attitudes have actually been not just the actual hills, but what has sunk Africa, bad attitudes, equals bad actions. And if we don't change our attitudes, regardless of how we do elections, regardless of the best institutions we have, whether it is the best judiciary, the very people in the society will get to those places with the same attitudes and will end up with what we have been seeing, if not even worse. Well, it's time I bring on the platform after those very uh, provocative, I would even say thought-provoking uh, th thought lines uh, you just emitted. Uh, it's time I bring on the platform the co-host, Professor Ben Bonga. Join me now in welcoming Dr. Ben Bonga. Thank you very much, Divine. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Dr. Monang, before I ask the question, I just uh, I must uh, first acknowledge uh, the tremendous response we are getting to Eric Wallace's uh, music, and. It is uh, fitting that Eric was talking about uh, the role of musicians in politics. And we can remember musicians across the continent. You know, Bobby Wine in, uh, in, in uh, Uganda is facing problems. 
uh, uh, Fela Kuti uh, played music and uh, talked to, to politicians and challenged politicians, but he also challenged citizens, which uh, is uh, exactly what you are talking about. So in, in what ways are the attitudes of citizens going to specifically bring about a, a change in how we look at governance? If you could give some specific examples to that, uh, we will start seeing where, where this idea of the soft aspects that you talk about come in. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, the, the, the point you've brought up is quite very, very important. I think before I go to your question, just to put trace on the aspect you've raised about music, which I think Eric did an amazing job, and he used his talent to pass a message, not just a message of hope, but a message that can actually inspire others to know that they are worth living, not just worth living, but what also serving. And that is the soft power that each and every one of us can leverage. We can leverage on our skills to be able to pass a message, or we can leverage on our skills to inspire one another to usher his or herself to action. We can leverage on our skills to motivate one another to build on what he or she have got. That said, when you look at the African continent today, the mainstream narrative is that governance equals government responsibility. To an extent, true, but that's not enough. Because the mainstream narrative have been perfected that way. What has resulted is that we, the citizens, sometimes sit full of our arms and wait for government to legislate, wait for government to implement, and wait for government to monitor progress and report back. It doesn't work that way anywhere. The role of the citizens, the citizenry have not been defined. And that responsibility that each and everyone should be able to be part of the development process have not been enshrined in ourselves. And I say so because you deserve, you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. What do I mean by this? When you look at the context of Africa, and I just want to put this in perspective so that at least the answer to your question can be understood by our viewers within the context of Africa, you get what you deserve. When you just look, even from a biblical perspective, you sow, you reap what you sow. When you look at the continent today, we complain and we blame everyone but ourselves. I would rather blame Professor Bongang than take responsibility and say, oh, I could have done it this way. We've perfected blame game to be an asset, but there's no asset anywhere in any stock exchange market in the world that is called blame game. We've perfected complaining to be an asset, but there is nowhere in the world where complaining is an asset. But when you look at the results that these have produced in the continent, they are just as the results we knew 50 years ago, the results we knew 10 years ago, and even the results we knew yesterday. So what is the point? The point is that the citizenry responsibility becomes very important. And this is what I call soft, because the attitude, if you just take the attitude of bribery, where you overhear sometimes people saying that your boss doesn't take bribe. I'm just giving an example. Oh, it means it's bad. Where you hear people sometimes abandoning opportunities in which they could have ceased to be able to just clear a document to help better a mother's life in a village, saying that someone else could have done it. Where in our homes, as we grow up, we are made to think that someone must be able to do something for us rather than making it to be that if somebody gives you something, it should be in exchange for value. So in a nutshell, we have perfected dependency. And as a result of that, we have not taken responsibility to be part of the solution process, but we've taken the responsibility to be part of the problem and blame game. Yes, uh, Dr. Morgan, let us... Uh take a hypothetical case. Let us imagine a citizen who is looking at himself or herself as more or less a victim of government in the sense that they are barely making ends meet. And they, they, they look from the bottom where they exist and, those, uh, and look at the top, those who are running the show, those who are enjoying the bribe, as you say. What does that poor citizen who can barely subsist do? And what would they do to move themselves ahead when they see the roadblocks 
that have been set for those of them who are not making decisions? Uh, Prof, you know you cannot put the cat in front of the horse. The reality is that if we diagnose only symptoms, no matter what you say to someone who has already made up his mind that someone else have to do it for him or her, that will not really change anything. What is my point? My point is we must go back to the fundamentals. And what are the fundamentals? The fundamentals are that we must start wherever we are to make it very clear to each and everyone that we have a sole responsibility to play our part. This young person you're talking about, somewhere without opportunity, half himself, because the biggest blessing is to be alive. And when you are alive with your skills and talents, if you cannot be able to retool your skills or to start making initiative to do something that can be able to move you forward, even if everything is given to you, nothing will change. And I say this from practical examples that we see. What am I trying to say here? You can only work with what you have. And I say it very realistically that if you do not leverage what you have, you will never get what you want to, you need. So when you leverage what you have, you can then make baby steps towards what you have always intended to get. But the attitude as we speak today is that people first of all start off by saying that I am poor. Poor in what? You are alive, so you should be grateful. You have your two arms and your two legs, so you should be grateful. Maybe you have some education. Education is not just about the classrooms or going to have a PhD or a master's. No, you may have studied a skill. So you can then be able to even volunteer your time to learn and perfect your skill even for free. And as a result of that, you are generating value. You are generating value which can then be exchanged in terms of money. So what is my point? My point is that when you look across the entire African continent today, there is no absence of policies. Actually, Africa, and I've said it in this show many times, Africa is actually sometimes regarded as a cemetery for policy in a, in a, joking, in a joking way that Africa is a cemetery for policies. The biggest actually hill is lack of implementation. And implementation, the role of government is to provide an enabling environment. And most of these policies are already there. Where did government stop an individual from leveraging, for example, an agricultural policy, which all countries do have what is called climate agricultural policy, to start intervening in the agro value chain or developing solutions like simple solar dryers to reverse post harvest losses, to make that our mothers in the villages, whether it is in Jinkwin or it is in Bali or anywhere across Cameroon or Nigeria or Kenya here? Where, where, where were we stopped to do that? We have continuously taking the easy part, which is complaining, rather than taking the part where effort is, is supposed to be put. And even where you put effort, it is equated to struggle, which is one of the biggest misnomers that I've never ever understood till today. Yes, uh, Doc, thanks very much. Uh, Divine will be coming in uh, to pursue this uh, uh, corruption that you, you hinted at. And Divine will be looking at the corruption of those in, in power and how we can apply you are thinking to that, Divine. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ben Bongang. Um, you talk about corruption again, when you talk about corruption across the African continent, if basically write an essay on corruption, take the name Cameroon off, put Nigeria, it reads the same. Remove <laughs> Nigeria and, and, and put Mozambique, same. It's like a recitation or a wind, same wind, same velocity that's blowing across Africa. How are you going to convince that person who is suffering in the pangs of poverty because of corruption at high level places that he is part of the problem? Where do the people who are corrupt come from? Don't they come from our very own societies? Don't they also come even sometimes from our villages and from our homes? Don't we applaud when the very people are appointed to this position? Which, which time have we ever applauded whether they have used those positions to touch people's lives in villages? We applaud only when they are appointed. So it means that we are part and parcel of this manes. Having said that, this is the point. The fact is that corruption is costing the entire African continent each and every year over 80 billion US dollars. But the reality is that you cannot be able to slay this dragon called corruption using the same approaches that cost this Manes. What is the point? Simple. We, what the continent is doing is trying to address the issue midstream. So if you have a river and you want to stop the river, 
You can't midstream with your buckets and you're trying to carry water and throw it away. Can you stop the river? No, it will even cause more damage. The point is that we are addressing symptoms, not addressing causes. And what are the causes? We need to go back to the source of the problem. And the source of the problem is people's attitudes. Okay, we I have mean, somebody on the line from Germany. You end on the note that the source of the problem is people's attitude. We noted that. Hello, Julius, you're calling from Germany. Hello. Yes, what's Good evening. It's my pleasure to be on your TV this evening on Tant Night Africa. You have a question for Dr. Richard or even Ben Bonga, who is co-host? Okay, <laughs> my greetings to all the co-hosts, Dr. Richard and Ben. I said I read the topic of today and I have a little contribution to make about uh, uh, society in Africa and the leaders, the governance, and the people in governance and the citizens too. Yes, we're listening to you. What's your question? Good. Yeah, I don't actually have a question, but uh, a short contribution to okay, what sir. I think. To what I think make uh, the citizens or the people of Africa responsible for the bad governance in our continent, most especially in our country, Cameroon. Uh, there, there, there are about four things I have to put. We have uh, too much respect. We too much respect our leaders or those in power. That respect makes us to feel inferior and to think that we do not have anything to contribute or we must listen to them. All what they say is like a gospel. And at one moment, the, 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 the people at the, the leadership position have also made it in a way that their subordinate must respect them to the fullest. You look in Africa, you will hear they call somebody Dr. Dees, they will call Professor Dees, Mr. Dees. But in Europe and America, especially in Germany where I am, you will not hear people at work call their boss Dr. Dees, Professor Dees. They call directly your name. If your name is like you are called Divine Chamukum, they will call you Chamukum or Divine. You will not hear any me there, you will not hear Mr. there. So that makes people live in equality. When you call your, 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 your boss with his name directly, he calls you with your name, you don't see that uh, disparity, you don't see that subordinate, you don't see that high position there. You see everybody equal, and you can share your thought without fear. You can share your thought without uh, being uh, inferior. You say, so because we think that we are too inferior to our leaders, we leave them just to rule, just to say what they want to say without anybody to correct them or to guide them because we are even afraid to guide them. We think that they have the gospel, that what they are saying, nobody can modify it. I was surprised in a meeting, in a church meeting, a pastor said, no, this decision is coming from the hierarchy and nobody can say anything about it. I say, can we not correct the hierarchy? Can we not tell the hierarchy what you are doing is wrong or it's not correct? So we just have to accept because it is coming from the hierarchy. It is too much um, a problem with us. We too give them respect and they enjoy the respect. They enjoy power and they don't want to leave it again. How do you expect somebody that they, they respect him so much turn now to be the one to respect others. <laughs> but if we look ourselves the same, our leaders understand that they are human beings too like us, and we become like in, in a flat surface, like in the same ranking, okay. every opinion, then we will uh, uh, have a change to make in our society. Point gotten, sir. And would you please go to point number two? Yeah, and the next one is uh, uh, the corruption that is in our society, in our African society and in Africa in general. The corruption there is being pushed ahead by us, the citizens. 
by us, the, the, the people, uh, forcing the people in leadership to be corrupt. We have made it such a way that everything for us must be possible. If it is not possible, we'll pay money and make it possible. If you, you, you write an exam and you think that you will not pass, you go and pay money. If you write an exam and you fail, you stay in your house and you rewrite again. Nobody in any office will come to your house to say, come and pay money, let me make you pass. But at times too, the people in leadership, they accept, since they accept the money, it encourages the citizen to always go and pay the money. So, and it makes them they enjoy this uh, uh, money that they give them. You will see somebody who has less than uh, 500 euros a month, living like somebody who is earning uh, 5,000 euros. And you ask yourself, where is this surplus coming from? From the bribery, from those people in the city, the citizens who are suffering, getting their money to go and pay back to have this or to have that. A simple thing like a simple driving license in Cameroon. Somebody can obtain a driver's license in Cameroon without touching the steering of the car. Are we not doing that to endanger our own self more than even those in leadership? Point. You, 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 will sit in your, you will sit in your house, you buy a driver's license, and then you go to the city side. And when a car burns like what is burning every day, we complain. Although, I can say although, 70% of the problem comes from the governor, the small 30% that we contribute if we are strict, Governors will change. We are the people who change the governors to change themselves. They will never change. Okay, what's your, <laughs> what's your third point, sir? The last point is, which is the third, which is the last, is that one is just to give many times to Chan Night and the Chan Night Africa TV that it is a means to communicate to the society, especially to the African society, what should be the best way of life. The best way of life is to not to pay this price, not to too much respect hierarchies as if they are God, to be able to tell hierarchies that know they are wrong, to be able to, to stand, on, stand firm on a point and push it ahead. And I think that uh, the Chan Night Africa TV is doing a great job. You are communicating just what Africans should know because I have been following you on Facebook and watching the TV on Facebook and all the programs, all those who come there and they talk, I see that if we propagate this message correctly and the masses in Africa, we will make a change. <laughs> Well, you will see that Africa is a very rich continent, but the poorest in the whole world. It is funny. It is, it is, it is very funny. Okay. Those that have nothing are making money than those who have. Why can a country like Germany, that the, the level of irradiation, sun irradiation in Germany do not reach what is in Africa? In, let me take, for example, like uh, Tunisia, uh, uh, Algeria, uh, um, uh, 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 Morocco. It doesn't measure it in any means. But the amount of money and the amount of life Germany makes from solar irradiation is 10 times more than what is happening in those parts of, uh, 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 those part of African continent. Why? Why do we have all these riches? We cannot exploit it because of bad governance, because we, the citizens, we accept every day what we do is yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. We never think to tell our leaders that no, you are wrong here, you are wrong and it is, you must stop, you must change. All we do is yes sir. One last thing, what I have noticed is all Africans above the age of 50, getting to 60, 60 something, what they want now is not to fix Africa, but to 
able to live as much as they can live and put it in their pocket, even on the block of their brothers and sisters. Thank you very much for having me on your TV. <laughs> so for uh, dialing in from Germany, thank you, sir. Wow, that, that, that really challenges all of you. Uh, both of you, you have PhD, both of you. Now, uh, Ben Bonga, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question. There's a high chance that if you went back to Cameroon, you could be named, because you qualified for the job, you could be named Minister of Communication or General Manager of Cameroon Radio Television. Would you want your subordinates, people you can just blink and they're fired. Would you want them to call you Ben Bonga instead of Professor Ben Bonga? Would you want them to challenge you? Challenge uh, your thinking? Uh, uh, absolutely. I, I, th there's no problem with that at all. Because uh, as uh, our uh, contributor from Germany said, you know, if it is the, the, uh, going to give people a sense that uh, we are all human <laughs> beings and we uh on the same level as human beings and each person can contribute whether they have uh several phds or or not uh as dr monang was saying if all of us as citizens can contribute and we have the hierarchies that we create with with titles are the hierarchies that sometimes are in the way of progress uh, so uh personally uh, first, I'm sure I will not be appointed anything <laughs> at all, because some of yeah. those appointments are political in the sense that uh, you have to belong to either the political party or uh, for certain senior positions, and I have nothing against that. And sometimes in the bureaucracies, you are appointing people because of their competence. And with that now, I think uh, Dr. Munang, if you if we switch now, because we are at that point where the question is, how do we bring about real change? I, I'm um, going to ask you, yeah, I'm going yeah. to have a question, uh, Dr. Munang, but yes. let me ask you this, Dr. Munang. The people who man ministries, ministers, general managers in Africa, the people who run for presidency were once people who studied in the West. It's one of the finest colleges, universities in the West. So what happens when they go back to Africa? Why is it that they get so power drunk? What's going on? And uh, why should anybody believe that if you went to Africa, you wouldn't do the same thing? The, 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 let me put it this way. And I think I will build on what um, uh, Professor uh, Bongang has said. And then when is... you answer, Professor Beth Bongang will take it there with you. Yes, I'm building on what he's already said. And that's the point. The reality is that positions do not implement. It is passion that implements. Whether you have a PhD, you don't have a PhD, it doesn't really matter. It is passion that implements and passion tied to something bigger than yourself, which is called purpose. The reality is that we've not been guided to find our own purpose to do something that is bigger than us, not only for material gain, but to touch other people's lives. And that has been the missing, missing link. The point is, we cannot solve the same problems we see today. We've heard using the same approaches of blame game, using the same approaches of complaining. If we do not accept responsibility, there is nothing wrong to complain and provide guidance and solutions. But what I think everybody must do wherever he or she is, is to say, this is what I will do as Dr. Richard Monang. And this is what I will engage with Professor uh, Bongang, with Ni Divine, to do together. What am I trying to say? I'm going back to Nee Divine's point on corruption, where we ended when I said that you must stop it at the source. Trying to address it midstream will not change anything. That is a failed strategy. That's a failed strategy and it will never work. Why am I saying, thing, the saying this? Corruption is a consequence of society's attitude. And that consequence of society attitude doesn't start now. It starts back in our homes and back in institutions in which we grow up getting to. For example, when that uncle or that auntie doesn't give something, you hear someone at that very tender age saying, ah, this uncle is wicked, this auntie is wicked. And even when it is given, it is not exchanged for value. It's not given that you need to take these resources and do ABCDs and report back. We are then inculcated to the attitude that we have the right of entitlement. Entitlement equals greed. Entitlement nowhere is anything around self selflessness. The second aspect is 
We are very, very self-centered. What causes corruption is self-centeredness, selfishness. We like to succeed alone and we want to take away, we like to even take away from those who can benefit. Because let me just make this correction on this show here, uh, with all due respect. Corruption is not just about stealing money. Wherever you are, if you are preventing opportunities for others, you are also corrupt. If you cannot sign off that paper to ensure that a child can be able to have access to an opportunity, you are corrupt. Self-centeredness is, is corruption. Greed is corruption. Let's get that right because we have equated corruption only to those in government and for those who are stealing money. No. Self-centeredness is what breeds greed and greed result in all these things we see. So we must then be able to know that the very people we're talking about, whether we studied in the West or we studied elsewhere, we grew up in that building that foundation, understanding that foundation that something has to be done for us, dependency mentality. And therefore, that is always there. What do we need to do now? Very simple, to start to move away from this false narrative and ugly truths that have been there for so long and to start dissecting it without any fear of contradiction. Yes, Dr. Moon, uh, as Divine was, was saying uh, earlier, and I, we who are in the diaspora, uh, whether in the African diaspora or Europe or North America, if we return to our countries, the question is what we bring as contribution and how do we implement that? And of course, there are hurdles. But the question I want us to, to, to shift to now is the educational component. What would you suggest as a way to prepare citizens to be this new generation of, of, of citizens who will feel empowered to contribute to society? Whether that education is at the family level or in a formal educational setting, well, it's, it's some ideas you have on that? Yeah, thanks a lot, Prof. Um, uh, I, I like to connect the dots so that at least I'm not just jumping to answer your question, but also building from uh, the uh, answer that I gave to Nidivan. You do not necessarily need to be in Cameroon to create impact and inspire people in Cameroon. You can inspire that from everywhere you, you are today. Like the show Chad Night Africa is being used now to empower not only Cameroon, but empower the entire African continent. That is an impact. That is action like Facebook, where people are there every day. Sometimes you see them tearing down one another. People are connected from even villages in communities. That is a place you can inspire one another. So the point is you must not be on the ground in Cameroon to inspire people to usher themselves to action. That is something that we need to be able to start debunking today. And back to your question on education. Education is not only about formal. It's also informal education. We start from our home. And the question is, how do we then start to inspire at that very young age, right from our homes, so that those young kids in villages can start to develop what I call self-belief. Because the biggest poverty in Africa sometimes we equate it to the $1.25. To me, I do not really agree with that, that poverty is just living below a dollar. There is also what is called, that is material poverty, and that's just one aspect. And to me, that doesn't even constitute 25% of the challenge we face in the African continent today. Emotional poverty is the biggest problem Africa faces today. Lack of self-belief. Always believing that if somebody do not externally validate your idea, then it is not right. That if someone, if if, me, if Professor Bongang tells me that this is right and someone else do not validate it from elsewhere, I cannot believe that Professor Bongang, what he's saying is right. Emotional poverty is a problem. And now back to formal education. The reality is, you see, Africa's education is a mismatch to reality. That's a fact. We're still dependent on a colonial education. And, and, and the fact that it's produced people like you, uh, Professor Bongam, me, Divine, and others across the world, is, is, is something we should be proud that we are resilient. But does it mean that it is fit for purpose? No. Why do I say so? Education in the continent is not much to address the challenges. The classical primary, secondary, high school, university, masters, and PhDs that we get are not geared towards turning challenges to opportunities. Then we come out with those certificates and said, government must give me a job. We are not creating job creators. We are creating job seekers. And when you create job seekers without the requisite skills to turn the challenges, whether it's challenges of post-harvest losses, challenges of ensuring that they can be able to turn west, 
to brickets or to turn waste to apparels that I can sell. And the challenges are many, but also presenting opportunities. When you don't premise your education to be fit for purpose by training people who can come out and create enterprises, then you get what you deserve. So the way moving forward on education is that um, the educational curriculum needs to be revamped. But not only at the formal level, starting from home, we need to start teaching our kids that they are able to do anything and they can achieve anything they want, but they must self-believe. The, the yes, second is, yeah, okay. the yes, second is when it comes to the formal education, what we need to understand is that it is not what you study that matters. My first degree was in physics and education, but today I am in the development world. Did I limit myself only to think the physics way? No. The biggest school is in the mind. An individual should develop purpose and become passionate enough around what he or she really feels that she can be able to make an impact and pursue that pathway, not only in the classroom, but using the tools that they do have. We have YouTube today. How many will go to YouTube to be able to learn a course there rather than watching football and knowing the names of players in the field and even the wives of those players than doing something that benefits his or her? Yes, Dr. Dr. Monan, uh, I, I would like you to address those in power today. Uh, have we lost them completely? Is there a, some hope that they can change? And how would that happen if corruption in most African uh, countries is, as we would say, in the blood or in the DNA of some? I'm not saying all of some. So what would you tell them? Or we should forget that we've lost them. We need everyone to work together. Those in power alone will not be able to drive transformational development because the reality is every action or decision taken, which is really what governance is about, is to drive one word, socioeconomics, is to ensure that a mother and a village should put food on the table. They have a role to play. Their role is to either legislate, their role is either to ensure that the implementation process, the enabling environment is there, they alone cannot do it. Am I trying to say that all of them are trying to do that? That's not the point. That's the world. We live in the world as it is. And the world as it should be needs each and every one of us to create. But sometimes what we forget, and these are hard truths I'm talking about here, what we forget is that your action, my action can inspire these people to be able to start doing right. But sometimes we don't want to do anything. We want to sit there and blame them and create an environment that becomes so toxic rather than playing our own part your action is never too small to inspire others. So everybody should play his part, not only depending and blaming others that they are not doing it. How did they go there? When they went there, which, who were those who were clapping? Uh, Divine? This is chat night. I reckon I told you that, uh, that the, the show today is going to be flammable. And I, I guess you are, you are realizing it from the content, from the responses, from the questions, and so on. The question somebody sends me here by text is, how do you start by um, dismantling this culture of personality cult? I think he's referencing the, the, the caller from Germany. The moment somebody becomes something in political leadership, he becomes untouchable. He becomes, even if they are friend in the quarter, in the, in the neighborhood, he just thinks that you're no longer at this, at this level. And so you cannot ask him questions. You cannot hold him responsible or accountable. How do you begin in Africa to dismantle this culture of building personality cults? Uh, Need Divine, I will go back to what I said and I will elaborate on that. The reality is, as we're speaking today, there was a research which was conducted by a university, a very renowned university in Kenya here, yeah, East Africa, called Aga Khan University. And this research was actually about youth views on how they can be able to move forward and grow their careers and become better. But the survey showed that these youth don't really care about the process. They want to be part of the product. Why am I bringing this? I'm bringing this up because we are talking about elitism here, as if there is a generation that is better than another. We are part and parcel of the same mess. And the reality is you cannot, I have said this here, you do not fight existing realities. You will not win. What you do is you develop alternative models 
that makes existing realities obsolete. What does it mean? Does it mean that everybody have that bad attitude of self-centeredness? No. You start to work with the willing. You start to work with the willing, and that creates a groundswell that will then even attract those who never ever believe that they can ever even be able to talk even to you to be part of the solution. Because one thing with Africans, and we sometimes don't talk about this, they only sometimes believe what they see. They don't care about concepts. They don't care about ideas. They only care about what they see. And they love to be part of the product, not part of the process. Does it mean that we should not be able to voice it out? That's how we're voicing it out here. But you do not voice out only by complaining. You voice through solutions. You voice through also ensuring that everybody should be on board. Because remember, a bird cannot fly with one wing alone. This is Chat Night Africa broadcast from Washington, D.C., hosted by Dr. Bernard Bonga, Ben Bonga, and myself, Divine Chamukon. Our guest today, live from Kenya, is um, Dr. Richard Muna. <laughs> Another question, and you can now follow this broadcast live on our website, www.chatnightafrica.net. Chatnightafrica.net, you don't have to be on Facebook or YouTube to follow this broadcast. It's going on live on our website, www.chatnightafrica.net. A question that just came to me by text. You can call into the program or indicate, send me a text, <laughs> and I will get through I'll get you through to the platform 240-603-7367. Let me repeat that. 240-603-7367. Question that just got to me by text. Dr. Richard Munang, this person is actually being very prosecutorial, prosecutorial to you. Um, he says, Dr. Munang, in your statements, you are diminishing the role of political leadership in the process of good governance in Africa, are you? No, and let me explain. My thesis statement stands, good governance needs everyone on board. We cannot subjugate it to only the politicians alone. The citizens are also supposed to be good examples because these politicians come from the very community in which we are in. So if we have attitudes that are geared towards taking what doesn't belong to us, when we end up in positions of power, will that change overnight? No. When we are taught that if we work hard to touch a life, we must be rewarded, either by force or by crook. Is that right? No. And if we end up in positions of power, wherever we are, are we going to do right to touch lives? No. What is my point? Simple. Each and every one of us have the sole responsibility to do what is right, wherever we are. And doing what is right cannot just be about ourselves and our immediate families, but doing what is right to touch the life of that mother in a village, whether that mother is in Tanzania or in Zambia or in Togo or in Mali or in Cameroon, it doesn't really matter. Our actions, wherever we are, should be shining examples because even those who are felt not to do it are also sometimes inspired by what we do. It therefore means that we cannot you get responsibility all the time to politicians as if we do not have a role to play. Remember, development and good governance is to ensure socioeconomic for all. And that responsibility rests on everyone's shoulder, including you and me. I can tell you that this is going to be distasteful to those who think that the finger is someone else responsible and when you hear when you when you as i said in the beginning listen to conversations among africans it is that that president is corrupt that minister is corrupt that german is corrupt that's why we are where we are now and, and as i said if we continue to think that way unfortunately we will continue to recycle people and nothing will change question to you um dr munang uh, and i'm taking my cue from where um uh, my uh, co-host, Dr. Bonga, left off. Um, he talked about uh, the educational system, the kind of education we received. The, my follow-up to that is, 
back in our primary schools in Africa, and let me take Cameroon because that's from where all of us come, we were taught to um, dissect lizards, frogs, cram the parts of grasshoppers, go the next day to examination halls and regurgitate the information we have, we pass in list A or we have an A grade, while the Chinese, the Koreans, the South Koreans are learning to, to build computers. Now, could that be part of the problem? And how are citizens responsible for this? Neil Divine, you've touched an aspect which I'm happy you've touched that. In, 19, in the early 60s, uh, when uh, many African countries were achieving independence, uh, South Korea was a country not only facing economic crisis, but South Korea was at that time also faced with acute hunger. And now many African countries did contribute and loan them. I know one that loaned them 10,000 US dollars, which was later paid back. But what's the point? Fast forward to today, South Korea economy is 15 times combined more than all the 54 African countries. How did South Korea uh, do it? We, we know the Samsung phones, the Samsung TVs, as you said. I know where I'm heading to, to answer your question. South Korea did it very simply. If you do not leverage on your strengths, and if you focus on your weaknesses, you will never go anywhere. If you leverage on your strength, you will be able to make impact. And your strength is the quality of your people. No matter how excellent a leader is, if this populace is not humble enough to be able to selflessly usher themselves to action, no matter how excellent you are, you will never create impact. That's a fact, tested. So what South Korea did was to focus on what I call comparative sector areas. In this case, they focus on textile sector where now they were producing and exporting this textile. And what happened was that the citizenry leveraged on what they have. And they were humble, not just to the cost, but at the same time to usher themselves using what they have, not what they didn't have, to be able to move forward. When you bring it back to the African continent today, do we leverage on our strengths? No. Africa is an agrarian continent. 65% of uncultivated rebel land is in this continent. 10% of internal renewable waters is in this continent. Why are we importing food worth 35 billion US dollars? Misplaced priorities. And that's why, as I said earlier, the education system must be able not only to be producing the classical primary, secondary, high school, using experiments that sometimes doesn't fit to reality and context of the continent, to now start matching not just the curriculum, but even attitudes towards seeing challenges as disguised opportunities and training and building people to come out of school and turn challenges to opportunities, not only to come out, pocket their hands and look for jobs. My point is you are better off inspiring people through the educational system to become entrepreneurial because a transformational Africa will never happen when we don't have purposeful citizenry. What does that mean in simplicity? People who are looking beyond themselves to learn and perfect their skills to turn a challenge that is closer to them than what they're thinking they can only do when they go abroad. When we have waste put in front of our houses, how many of us have thought of, oh, I can turn that waste to something better? We wait for city council to come and carry it. When we eat in our homes, we throw plates on the sink for someone else to watch it. This attitude then they get carried through even to offices, and we sit and we say that politicians are the only ones to solve the problems. Where do the politicians come from? Where me and you come from? <laughs> uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, somebody says, divine to start tearing down these walls of personality calls. I just got that text. Begin to call Ben Bonga, Ben Bonga, and Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, this is a beautiful, um, and the guy whose name is on the screen, uh, Ze Roger. This is a multi-talented, a truckload of talents. Here's the guy who is in Lagos, but monitoring to make sure that this broadcast is aired on our website live and is being aired through the website chatnightafrica.net. Here's the guy who built the uh, fascinating website for Chat Night Africa. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. You are actually an asset to the house. Um, before I bring on Ben Bongan to the platform, Richard, here is uh, another question from um, somebody. And I have a phone here, so you can call the number you can text. 
7367. And the purpose of this broadcast is to challenge us because until we can look into the mirror and say, hey, look, listen, the problem isn't another person. <clears throat> How did I contribute to it? We will never fix it. We will recycle people. People will come and go and the situation will not change. Now, talking about people coming and going, let's look at the African opposition. We had Sunny Abacha, who uh, took over in Nigeria and became worse. If you listen to him, when he staged the military coup and succeeded, you would think that a savior had come to Nigeria. If you look at Robert Mugabe, the late Mugabe, when he fought with Joshua Nkomo in the bush, you would think, I mean, he saw everything wrong with what was going on. Um, you would have thought at the time that a Moses was coming. If you look at Daniel, uh, uh, Dennis Sasson Wesso in Congo, same story. We could go on and on and on. I remember when Mr. Paul Bia took over in Cameroon in 1982, we did not think that 35, 38 years after we would still be talking about corruption because the mantra was rigor and moralization. Here's why I'm bringing up the litany of people who have come and, come and gone and nothing changing. <clears throat> why should people continue to trust the African opposition when you have all these examples? When you look at the reality of things, because I want to be putting it in perspective, and, and um, that's what I said from the beginning and I'll continue to do so. Democracy is important. But when let's just go to Asia a little bit. Singapore with Lee Yen uh, ruled the country for about 30 years. Singapore in the 60s, uh, this is not a mineral driven country. Uh, started from scratch while well, some African countries, even the per capita, per, uh, most people in Africa at the time was 10 times the per capita of a Singaporean. Today, Singapore prides itself as one of the big financial uh, not only a uh, country, but even in the entire region in Asia, it's among the best. But for how long did uh, Li Ying rule the country? And, and why did Singapore rule from where it was to where it is today? Leadership is not about positions alone. It's about visions. And visions are not driven by an individual. Visions are driven by the citizenry. And the citizenry must be willing and have the aptitude and humility to be able to play their part. And playing that part not to benefit themselves, but to solve collective, continental, or country, or regional problems. That attitude is absent in the citizenry of the continent today. The self-centered and selfishness is an attitude problem that if we do not address, we will be in problem. Why do I say this? Visions are not slogans. Visions are supposed to be around challenges where the rule of citizenry is clearly defined so that that citizen knows that I have a role to play as the enabling environment is also created, not only government responsibility as we blame. With that, a clear vision where every citizenry is engaged, but the citizenry engaged must have an attitude of service, what I call a heart of service. In the continent today, how many of us have a heart of service? Because a heart of service is made up of love and kindness, love for one another, love for that mother that I've never seen in Bafut or in Bali or in, 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 in Santao, where you are doing something not to benefit you, but knowing that it will have a ripple impact even in Nigeria or in, in, in Zambia. We must cultivate a heart of service, not a heart of disservice. And this takes love and kindness. And these are the tenets of selflessness. Until we cultivate that love and kindness to do things that benefit others, not only ourselves, this discussion, even in the next 100 years, will not move an inch. Monang, uh, you have, you, you've uh, mentioned South Korea, you've mentioned Singapore, those countries that uh, uh, speeded up their development, and we can measure the development by the things they produce and uh, the per capita of their people that has shot up in a relatively short time. Is there any place on the African continent that is doing anything close to what Singapore or, 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 or South Korea did that would be where we look for as examples? Or are we all 
you know, suffering corruption has made it impossible to see a light anywhere. Thank you very much, Prof. The reality is that the Africa of today is not the Africa of the 1960s. And I've said this here many times, if we do not appreciate progress, we can never make meaningful progress. The Africa of today is far much better and a lot of achievements have happened across uh, different regions in the continent. And what happens for country A may not necessarily uh, be exactly the same way it will happen in country B. So I, I do not like to use a particular country example, because let me put it this way. Our mothers in the villages, in which I believe most of us grew up in the villages, went to primary school in the villages, were able to feed us, were able to guide us, were able to give us the right lessons to beat us when we did something wrong. They taught us those moral values. Are, are, are those not excellent examples? The chief in the village could give instructions that every weekend we have to go cleaning. We have to dig roads. That was governance. What has happened to those things today? Because what I'm trying to say is that we go looking elsewhere for good examples. When what we went through that were good examples that have even have molded us to be what we are today, we don't benchmark that. That's, uh, those are things that in the very countries we came from were excellent. What is my point? My point is the region of Africa today have the good, the bad, and the ugly. But we talk a lot about the ugly and the bad. But without knowing that if we do not build on the good, we will not move forward. And one of the good is that the youth of the continent are not only rising up, they are rising up with solutions and tools that are not communicated to the world. And sometimes we do not even appreciate what we do in the continent, except embracing what comes from elsewhere or except it is validated externally. And that's why I use the word emotional poverty, lack of self-belief. Until we Africans, Start appreciating what happens, especially where it is information communication application tools, where youth coming together, for example, in Kenya, here to develop, to help a mother in a village to be able to connect her cassava when she produced to a market. Or it is in West Africa where young people have come together in Nigeria and Togo and Ghana, devising local machines to turn waste to briquettes. My point is, excellent things are happening in the continent, but Africans do not communicate and frame their narratives to project the, using the soft power they have, but they project problems, problems, problems. And uh, let's uh, go push that a, a little further and think about the in political infrastructure that most of the countries keep uh, erecting and then modifying and changing the constitutions and, and, uh, and, and regime types. Now, how can we, using your vision for development, use some of those political structures? Or is there any connection between uh, the political structures that exist and the vision of development that you see as a way forward? How can we, we, we build on, on, on those structures? The vision of development for Africa is one in which we need to embed in each and every citizen that you are responsible. Because one thing is this, that's a very good question. We do not do development for people. You cannot do development to the people of Bali. What you can do, you can only help to facilitate because they are on the ground and they do it for themselves. I cannot do development for the people of Jinkui, where I come from. What you can do is only to facilitate it, to, to help come in to close a gap and they lead on the, the seat, on the driver's seat as you lead from the rear. But there is that false narrative that development can be done for people. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is the people can do quite well if they are guided to know that you must work with what you have. There is a, a belief that if there is no money, nothing can be done. That's a fallacy. Our mothers in the villages as we were growing up, did they have even one dollar? But did we ever go to bed without being fed? What am I trying to say? Leverage on what you have, and if you look at the continent today, the political elite have done excellent in proliferating policies. But the citizenry have not leveraged on those policies to drive entrepreneurial transformation. The one government to legislate, the one government to implement. And I've always asked this, what is so special about us Africans as compared to Asians or Latin Americans? The Bible and the scripture said it. God is no respecter of persons. 
We are given the same chance. We should seize the opportunity and use and leverage what we have. There is nothing wrong to complain about an issue, but there is something wrong to complain without acting to prove that there is a way in which it can be done to touch a life in a positive way, not in a negative way. And that attitude is the problem. Unless we start to groom those young people with an attitude and with a heart of service, that can create a groundswell pool of young people who can start to show that things can happen differently, we will end up with what we have today. And so the answer to your question is grand action that help inform transformational development will inspire politicians. Ideas and concepts are not necessarily always palatable to the elite, but actions that is proven actually attracts them to be part of it and sometimes they support it. Since you, 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 you are placed in a, a vintage position and travel probably the continent and see the differences, as you said earlier, it is difficult to compare all the, the countries because each one is distinct. Yet, when you travel around uh, uh, the continent, you, it's, it's uh, quite surprising the differences in terms of infrastructure. I was in, uh, in Ghana a couple of years ago and I was impressed by the road network. And I could not help but wonder, what is it that the Ghanaians were doing to have this amazing infrastructure of roads, which is essential to all development, and what was happening in other countries where the potholes are so deep that you could lose a vehicle in. So what, what are some of the things that you see from your position as a development expert traveling the continent that some of the countries are doing better? And how can we merge that with your uh, uh, vision? What, what can those countries that are not working well learn from those who are doing better? Room was not built in one day. And even people from the same family, from the same born by the same mother are not the same height or the same size. My point is, when you look across the continent today, as you rightly put it, that's true. But what I always say, and this is my own uh, personal view uh, based on my experiences and the way I think uh, things can be put together is, does Africa really just need big infrastructure? Isn't the biggest infrastructure the mindset of the citizens? Building an excellent airport is good. Good roads is good. A flood today can be able to bring down that airport or that road or those buildings in a second. Will the citizens have the requisite skills and the capacity and talent to rebuild? Absolutely. You are just as strong and transformational developer as your citizens. Uh, what is my point? Unless we focus development on the citizenry to ensure that they have a transformed mindset to know that we can do it by ourselves, and give them the requisite skill and inspire them to have the requisite skills. The transformational development we see is good. Good optics, but might not be long lived. The second aspect is, this big infrastructure is for what in the first place? Is it connecting routes to farms where mothers can be able to assess markets because most of our mothers in the villages produce enough food and they get wasted because they do not have access to markets because the routes are not even there? Or is it just infrastructure, big infrastructure with trillions of dollars spent on it that takes you to nowhere? That then means that we need a different way of thinking, which is what I call policy harmonization, where energy policy speaks to agricultural policy. And that policy to build a big route should be built in such a way that it connects to where farmers are growing their food and connecting them to markets, where financial policy influences local cooperatives like in Janguis to be able to assess more financing so that it's accessible to the common person in the community, where trade policies are helping that what is produced is viable in the international market. So the point is, the biggest infrastructure is people's minds. And unless we start to drive that mindset change to know that people should self-believe that they are the ones they need, then we might be in for a very long run. And before Divine comes in, if you could just speak uh, uh, to the, the fact that most of our countries the economy is uh, based on agriculture, but our markets are still European markets. We are still selling mostly raw materials and we are not transforming 
the, the, the fruits that we, we grow, nor the vegetables, nor the coffee, nor the cocoa that we produce. If you could just speak to that as part of this uh, new vision for development, what could change there? And how could the citizens be part of that change? This is already happening. The reality is, as you speak, uh, the biggest cocoa producing countries are in the continent, whether you're talking Cote d'Ivoire or Ghana, uh, but we don't turn the chocolate, the cocoa into chocolates. Actually, it is a 100 billion US dollar uh, industry, but Africa cannot boast of any chocolate industry in the continent. So we, 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 we sweat as others eat sweets. Uh, that, what am I trying to say? Africa's transformation is to ensure that it adds value to what it produces. But what we are seeing is it is not lost yet because young people through a spirit called innovative volunteerism are developing local solutions to help turn these products into final products that they can fetch money. And the good news is we must appreciate progress. The Africa Continental Free Trade, which actually kicked in January 2021, is an opportunity for Africa to trade with herself. So the point is, it is not only government alone to devise solutions to start adding value. What needs to happen is the enabling environment that is already there in terms of policies, people should be able to leverage them and do their bit as they demand for more. If we just sit full our arms, we might not be able to move forward. Dr. Richard Muna, or Richard, as somebody <laughs> recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to touch a little bit on the sensitive uh, people who are Christians, um, evangelical, evangelical Christians are watching this broadcast, pastors, bishops, priests are watching this broadcast, or the wheel, the replay. Some people attribute the problems of Africa, the bad governance of Africa, all the things we talk about, we denounce, complain, to the proliferation of prophets and churches. To what extent do you disagree or agree? You see, you see um, the reality is that when Jesus turned water into wine, he asked that water be put into that jar. He didn't put the water into the jar. He asked that water be put into that jar. So someone needed to do something. And that was turned into wine. What is the point? No pain, no gain. We, we cannot sit without making effort and expect miracles to happen. The biggest miracle you are waiting for is yourself. You have the brains, you have your two hands, you have the intellect. It is up to you to act. As you pray for wisdom and compassion, you cannot sit and pray for electricity when the continent is having 365 days of sunshine, instead of ushering and inspiring young people to devise solutions to tap the 365 days of sunshine to provide electricity in the village, we are praying for what God has already given us. We cannot sit and say that we want jobs for our youth when we cannot inspire them to use their talents to then be able to turn their skills to something that they can use to add value and turn a challenge into an opportunity. My point is prayers alone without action, and that is biblical, prayers alone without action is not enough. In James chapter 2, verse 17, faith without work, you know the rest. Richard, you know what? It's hard to take you by surprise with any question. <laughs> when I asked you that question, I wasn't sure what answer it. <laughs> That's why we bring you here. And uh, wherever you are on the African continent, if you know somebody who thinks they because you see, you know what? We're not going to change Africa by recycling people with the same mindset. And I keep saying this over and over and over. It will take people who think differently, who, who, whose mentality, mindset is different to make the difference that we want to see. That might have to begin with what you can do where you are and with what you have. The other question that I, I just got from a text is, um, 
I, I've listened to, and we're going to wrap this shortly, wrap this up, up shortly. The other, I, I've listened to a lot of your videos. I mean, and that's how I got to knowing you. And then we became great friends and uh, just doing stuff together. I appreciate you. You're not a fan yeah. of projects. There's so many projects, NGOs in Africa, and you saying that's even where the corruption, the corrupt mindset begins. How so? Uh, I wish this could have been another topic for another day. The, 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 the point is very simple. You cannot have an attitude that a project equals money rather than an idea that you can then engage everyone to be part of. When we equate projects to be equal money, the attitude is that no money, no action. And when projects come with money, some people think that that's their cash car, right? That, so, so my point is, you, if you have a wrong input, you have a wrong output. But we should not, we should be able to move beyond projects because projects are actions. We need an inclusive framework of thinking. For example, if you take a village anywhere in the continent that needs, for example, world creation for the, for the youth, and it is an agrarian, an agricultural village, you then need to engage the people to understand their problems. You don't need money for that. When you understand and they tell you that they are losing this amount of food because they cannot dry, because they use open sun dry, what you need to do is to mobilize those who can be able to provide or develop solar dryers. What is that? That is beyond a project. That is a vision, a solution thinking vision that you can mobilize people to solve that problem without necessarily even having, and if money was to come in, it should facilitate the processes, facilitate people coming together, facilitate to close gaps or to get the material in which the solar dryer is uh, 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 supposed to manufacture. So the point I'm trying to say is that the classical project equals money mentality, that no money, no action, is what has consumed Africans. And we sit saying, we don't have money to do a project. Just inspiring a youth is a project, telling that youth, look, you have to do it this way. This is what I learned. Guiding and mentoring people is also a project. Do you need money to mentor people? Do you need money to inspire someone? So the mentality of project equating to money alone is a misnomer. And therefore, that attitude goes back to the point I said, the attitude that someone must do it before we act, and that if dollar signs are not there, we cannot use our efforts and our skills and talents and what we have our means to do it, is what has continuously drive us down this pathway, where when they end up where there are those opportunities, self-centeredness become a real aspect. Because anybody who is proud or selfish, wherever he is, didn't start today. He only got an opportunity to express the real him or her. Uh, Dr. Molan, this has been uh, great. Uh, your presence today and uh, previous Thank one. You. But uh, if you could say in a sentence or two, what all of our audience listening today should take away, what would that be? Passion. A passionless human being and a passionless populace is as worse as what you can ever imagine. One purposeful, passionate human being is worth more than 1.2 billion people. Why do I say so? Without passion, and not passion is not equated to greed. Greed is not passion. I'm talking passion to do something beyond yourself and your family. Without nurturing and inspiring people to become passionate in seeing challenges as disguised opportunities, we might never be able to address the governance challenges in the continent because selfishness will continue. And therefore, we must nurture passion. Nurture passion in people to see themselves as solution providers and make them become purposeful that you must do something beyond yourself and tie it to a vision that I can be sitting here and thinking that I can help a kid in southern Zambia or in, or in Cameroon or in Nigeria and do it leveraging on what you have and building on already existing institutions without reinventing the wheel and competing with your brothers and sisters. And the last aspect, affirmative action in Africa needs to change. That we clap when people are appointed to positions as if it is an end, and they will never ever clap on what they have done, that we do not appreciate our local heroes in our communities who have never gone to school and are doing excellent things, we don't even appreciate them, that we take optics to be the norm and not the exception, we must never ever again normalize abnormality. It is wrong. <laughs> this is, you, you know what? <laughs> You're gonna make a lot of enemies tonight. 
Sorry. <laughs> I, I tell you what, probably, um, let me ask you, not you, Dr. Munang, you, Richard, let me ask you watching. Why do you celebrate when your brother is made minister? Why do you celebrate when your cousin or uncle or son daughter is made a general manager of a corporation? Why do you kill yourself over where the president of your country comes from? We have to start asking this question. And I'm going to leave Richard respond to this as a last word, and then we close the broadcast. Richard. The, the, the narrative, again, and I'll go back to where I started, the biggest aspect of governance is people, and the attitudes of the people determine the kind of governance that a country can get. We have this attitude that he or she is our own, and that is divitis. Everybody should be our own. If we are given a responsibility, we should do it to benefit the sons and daughters of every part, the brothers and sisters of every part of the continent, regardless or even of the world. The point then is we should celebrate success. And I want to put this clear. We should celebrate success. And we should move away from false narratives. Yes, a lot of people will not be happy. With all due respect, false narratives are actually the causative cause of the African problem today. But we should always understand one word, socioeconomics. If that mother in the village through our actions cannot be able to benefit, we have failed. Success is about lifting others from the bottom of the pyramid. If we do not lift others up and we think that because we have a PhD, we are the best or work in big organization, we are the best, we have failed. Success is about lifting others from the bottom of the, the pyramid and inspiring them to usher themselves to action. And more importantly, there's nothing wrong to disagree. It is a fundamental human right enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to express views, but at the same time, don't infringe on other people's rights. In Article 29, very clearly articulated, and more importantly, Article 3, the right to life. What does it mean? Addressing governance issues takes you and me, but respecting one another and knowing that the only thing that matters at the end is action, because the only beauty that we know is action that touches a kid and a mother's life. Thank you. That's how we <laughs> wrap up this <laughs> clinic broadcast. I really appreciate you in the same way as uh, Ben Bongang does. Uh, he is a co-host at this um, uh, Pan-African platform, Voices of Africa Chat Night Africa. Thank you so much. We extend through you from the fountains of Chat Night Africa love to all the people, the beautiful people of Kenya. And we appreciate you being a, plug, a, fra, a flat bearer of this platform. This broadcast has been going on our website, um, chatnightafrica.net, thanks to Zé Roger Fall, the powerful IT guy we have in the house. He is such a blessing to Chat Night Africa. Roger, watching from Lagos, thank you, a mighty thank you to you. Richard, thank you for coming on. That has been uh, Chat Night Africa, and we will be arranging to bring more people of this caliber so that to, together we can weaponize ourselves. Information is power, but it's even more powerful when you can use the information and actually act on. That's when it makes, it creates an impact. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we wrap up this broadcast chat night. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to kiss down. I'm coming. I'm coming. Coming to dance. To dance. We're gonna dance. We're gonna dance. We're gonna get down. We're gonna get down. We gon' party, party hard. We gon' boogie, boogie woogie. 